Praise the Lord. Good morning again, everybody. Now, it's, um, it comes in handy being the speaker sometimes. You know, there was a reason why I chose Majesty. Because that's what I'm calling the message today. The Majesty of God. The Majesty of God. Hallelujah. Worthy are worthy are you, Lord. Worthy to be thanked and praised and worshipped and adored. Is that on your heart today? I hope so. Praise God. You turn with me please to John 17. John 17. I'm just going to read one verse today. John 17. I'm only taking one verse, but we'll read the first three verses to get it into context. Jesus speaking. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I'm going to stop there. This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. In the message, is that echoing a bit? Maybe it's me speaking too loud. How's that? Is that better? One, two. How's that? Can you still hear me? Okay. In the message I brought last week, if you were here, you all remember, hopefully, we spoke about our gathering together unto him and the importance of our gathering together unto him and what that meant in our relationship and the ultimate consequence of of not doing that was to fall into apostasy in the eyes of God the Father. So it's important that we come together but when we come together what do we see? What do we look for? What do we hear? What do we pray to? Who do we sing to? What do we sing to? And last week the message was really about the image that we hold about God and how that affects the way we worship him, wasn't it? Well today what I want to do is is to cause us to have a look, reflect on ourselves what our image is of God. What our image is of the God that we serve. And our text today gives us somewhere to start. And really that's all it is. It's just a beginning. Because what Jesus did for us at that time was a great and a mighty thing, wasn't it? great price was paid. A great demand was met to give us the privilege of coming into the presence of Almighty God. But that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. That's where eternal life really starts. And it's for each one of us to get to know the depth of the Father. Because it's a personal relationship, isn't it? It's a personal relationship as in a marriage. We're going to look at that a little bit more later. A personal relationship that we're embarked upon. First of all, we're going to start by those words, to know him. Then if you remember a chorus we used to sing years and years ago. Seems a long time to me anyway. To know him, to know him. 
is the cry of my heart. Spirit, reveal him to me. To hear what he's saying brings joy to my heart. To know him, to know him alone. That should be the cry of the whole of the body of Christ. Because isn't that what we're called to? What did Jesus say? This is eternal life, that they might know thee. And it's that knowing that we're going to look at today. Knowing him. The words of Jesus in the text that we've read today might have been the very inspiration for those words, to know him, to know him. But let's take a closer look in our quest to know the Father. That phrase there, that they might know, in your version it may be slightly different, but mine says, this is an eternal life, that they might know thee. That they might know is actually one Greek word, ginosko. Ginosko, or ginosko. And that word means the following. It means to learn, to know, to come to know, to get knowledge of, to perceive, to feel, to understand, to know. And it's also a a Jewish or Hebrew idiom for the sexual partnership of a husband and a wife. To become acquainted with and to know. Remember back, right back in Genesis, he tells us that Adam knew his wife. And they begat sons. And that Hebrew word there is yada. Yada. And it means virtually exactly the same as this Greek word. It's that intimate knowledge. But however, how are we to know this almighty God? This almighty God that's known to us as Yahweh or I am. Let's have a look at what that name actually means. We're going a bit deeper today. Is everybody still with me? Nobody's fell asleep yet. Hopefully you don't. This I am tells us that God is self-sufficient and self-existent. What does that mean? Well, self-existent, I looked up these uh, phrases, these, these titles if you like, in several dictionaries, concordances, whatever. And this is what the majority of them said about these two um, titles, let's say, two uh, statements. Self-existent means to exist without being created. To exist without any outside sustaining force or source. That's pretty clear, isn't it? That's self-existent. Self-sufficient means to be able to provide for your own needs without any help from anyone or anything else. And some of you have probably got in mind uh, that uh, 1970s show The Good Life where they were supposedly self-sufficient on food and everything else. But our God is more than that. Our God is far more than that. It's true of Yahweh that he he is self-existent and he is uh, self-sustaining, self-sufficient. Our God is always also almighty, isn't he? El Shaddai, almighty God. Or as we would call him omnipotent, omnipotent. Omnipotent means having unlimited power and to be able to do anything at any time. All power. Able to do anything at any time, anywhere. Or at all times, in all places. (laughs) This is the God whom we serve. But because Yahweh or God created everything, 
is also omniscient. What does omniscient mean? It means to know all things. To know all things at all times. About everything. In other words, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that God doesn't know. And because he is self-existent, he always has been and he always will be, he's always known that. There's no end to his knowledge. There was no beginning and there's no end to his knowledge and his power and his ability to exist without anyone or anything else to sustain him. Because Yahweh, or God, has created all things, he's also omnipresent. These are hard things to get your head around, aren't they? Because he has created all things, he is also omnipresent. It means he is everywhere at all times. Because he created everything. He holds the universe in his hands. This is the God whom we serve. Ultimate, absolute knowledge. Ultimate, absolute power. Ultimate, absolute existence. An ultimate, absolute presence. Everywhere, at all times. What was your image of God before you came today? Was it someone you just chatted to on occasion? In a ten minute prayer? Or is it something that holds, is he someone that holds you in awe every time you think about his name? This is the God that we serve, or rather, a small, insignificant glimpse of the God whom we serve. Because we are looking at this subject through finite eyes, through finite minds. God is infinite mind, infinite understanding. We are limited in our bounds because we are created beings by him. So because Yahweh created everything, God, calling him Yahweh because that's how he's revealed himself to mankind, isn't it? God seems just sometimes so insufficient. Yahweh is the I am. The self-sustaining, self-existent, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, creator God. There's something awesome in that name. And because he has created everything, and because of everything we've just looked at, he's obviously so far beyond our understanding as to make him incomprehensible. And that's exactly what he is. Incomprehensible. Take a look at Isaiah 55. Turn with me if you will. Isaiah 55. I have it written down so I don't have to turn to it. But it gives me time to have a slurp. While you are. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. How many times have you probably read these scriptures? I want you to look at them and read them with what we've just been talking about in your mind. Verse 8, Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So then, just how does a mere created, mortal, finite, fallible mankind even begin to comprehend the awesomeness of the Creator God? How can we begin to comprehend the incomprehensible who is in all and over all and through all at all times? (laughs) Well, thinking about these things can send you insane. And it has done many, many people. Because he is so far beyond what we can imagine. Awesome doesn't even come close to who and what Yahweh is. But we will see him one day. In his majesty. In his glory. But not until we are changed. Not until we are conformed to the full likeness of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only then could we stand to see him in his glory. Turn with me, if you will, to John 14. John 14. Just going to read a few verses. John 14, down to verse 9. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, There you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not where you go, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long a time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? You know, this is the most wonderful, incredible thing that an incomprehensible creator God could ever do for a created being. Reveal himself. Reveal his nature and his character in a man a God man yes this is the amazing mystery of the Lord Jesus Christ Yeshua Hamashiach our salvation the Messiah the fullness of the I am in the form of a man And yet that fullness confined to the limits of a man. Jesus never once used his divine power. If he had, how could we ever do the things that he did? How could he be our representative before the Father? He had to live, he had to exist, and he had to walk and minister as a man. 
Maintaining that purity. Maintaining that integrity. In order to take on himself the sin of mankind. To be a pure and holy sacrifice for us. We spoke of that last week. The offering had to be clean, it had to be pure, without spot, without wrinkle. And blood had to be shed. And yet there he is. Jesus' own words, Jesus said to him, He that has seen me, has seen the Father. Mankind had seen the character and the nature of almighty, incomprehensible creator God in this man. His very nature, his very character was there revealed in Jesus Christ. The Son of God, but also the Son of Man. However, having seen the character and nature of Almighty God and getting to know God are two different and distinct things, aren't they? I see you. Hopefully you see me. (laughs) But you don't know me. And I don't know you. To the depth of your character. Only by spending time, large amounts of time, could I ever hope to begin to know you. And those of you amongst us today who are married know that that is true. You never truly know anyone unless you have spent a long time with them and been through many different situations and circumstances together. Isn't that true? Man will never understand woman. (laughs) Do you know why? Lynn's rolling her eyes because she knows exactly what I'm going to say. Man will never understand woman because man was asleep when she was made. By God. Well, that went down well. (laughs) Okay. But do you get the idea? We can see someone and we can see the character and the nature of someone in the way they act and react to things, but you will never know that person to any depth unless you spend quality time with that person or with those people. And the same is true of our relationship with Almighty God. God showed mankind his character and his nature in the person of Jesus Christ. He showed us that nature and character. And Jesus said, if we have seen him, we've seen the Father. But Jesus himself exhorts us to know the Father. Because that's eternal life. To know him. You know, the the disciples spent three years with Jesus. Living with him, walking with him, eating with him, sometimes suffering with him. Three years. And yet, at the end, they still didn't truly understand why he came. Acts 1 verse 6. When they were therefore come together, they asked to him, saying, Lord, will you now at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They hadn't understood. 
that he didn't come as a conquering king then. He came as a suffering servant then. But he would come as the conquering king later. But they'd been with him for three years and didn't fully understand. How long have you been saved? Today. Don't shout it out. But think, how long have you known the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour? And how well do you know him? How well do you know his word? As Jesus said, if you have seen him, you've seen the Father. And to the extent you know him, you will know the Father. Something to think about, isn't it? Yes, Jesus came primarily to pay the price for sin, to provide the ultimate sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. He came to do that, that's true. But another part of his coming was to show us the incomprehensible Father. Then seeing him and him through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to go deeper and to begin to know him. To build that relationship. To become a son or a daughter. Remember right at the beginning I said that the Greek word for they might know was ginosko. And one of the uh, meanings of that word was close intimate knowledge between a husband and a wife. And it is so. Do you know in Hebrew thought they, 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 uh, they believe that the Holy Spirit hovers over the couple as they take their vows and as they go through the, the marriage bed. Just as the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters of the deep at the creation. And the Holy Spirit's work was to bring into being that which was spoken. So it is in the marriage bed. This is what the the Jews believe. Let me ask all your husbands out there, how much do you really know your wife? Not looking at anybody in particular. How much do you really know your wife? And I'll ask the wives the same question. How much do you really know your husband? Do you spend time together? Talking? This knowledge isn't gained overnight, is it? Please let me know you're there. (coughs) It's not gained overnight. It's gained over years of experience. Going, as I said, through situations and circumstances that challenge you both. And each one brings something different to that relationship. And the married life is those two entities becoming one, isn't it? Not just physically, but mentally, psychologically. Knowing what the other one is going to how he's going to react to a certain thing or what he's going to say in a certain circumstance or what pleases them, what displeases them. These things are gained over time and so it is with our relationship with the Lord. If we have seen Jesus, we have seen the Father in his character and his nature. But as we get to know Jesus, who he is and what he is in our life. So we begin to know the Father and who and what he is. There's an interesting scripture in in Proverbs. Will you turn to me? Not turn to me, but turn to it with me. 
Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18 says this. In my version it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You know that word, vision, is actually the Hebrew word para, and it actually means to loosen. And a better translation is to cast off restraint. To cast off restraint. Indeed, many other versions put that in that verse. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. I want to put to you today that that vision that the writer is talking about is the vision of God. Who God is, what he is, and what he is and who he is to us. And I want to put to you that if we don't have the right vision of who and what God is, through Jesus Christ. That is a reason why much of the church casts off restraint and goes its own way. And in the end, we'll perish. Because if the truth of God isn't there, something else will be. If the Spirit of God isn't there, another spirit will be. And do we see that around us today? I am dismayed at much of what passes for Christianity in the Church of God in general today. Some things I heard this week terrify me for these people at the thought of what they're doing to their own soul. Those who have no vision will cast off restraint and perish. What is your vision today? Do we have a healthy respect and a reverence for God, you know, that's one thing that I think is sorely missing. Not here. I'm not speaking about here today. But generally in the church, the body of Christ, I, I discern, I, I see a lack of reverence. And just plain respect for who God is. He created us. He created the universe. He created the world in which we live. How can we have the utter arrogance to say that that's not enough? To say that we can do better? To say that what we think is more important without vision, the people cast off restraint and perish. I know it says, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. This is in the Old Testament. We keep the law by our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of the relationship with him is that me? Is that okay? At the heart of our relationship with Him should be our love for the Father. But at the centre of our relationship and our walk with Christ Jesus and the Father, because don't forget we're getting to know the Father through Jesus Christ. 
at the centre of all that should be, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind and all your strength and your neighbour as yourself. Didn't Jesus say that was the core of the law? And that should spring from our love for him. Who he is. What he is. We're new creations in him. That is fulfilling the law. That is fulfilling our calling as sons and daughters of the living God. Because it's already been done in Jesus Christ. And to bring us full circle again. One day, you know, we're going to be perfected. One day we're going to be as he is. Hallelujah. We're going to be as Jesus is now. He's already told us in what we read today. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And if he's gone to prepare a place, he will return. To take us to be where he is. Aren't you looking forward to that? Aren't you looking forward to that? Hallelujah. Well, three of you are anyway. But we're called to know this incomprehensible God. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he sent. We're called to know this incomprehensible God, and he's given us the means to do it. He's given us the means to do it, brothers and sisters. And that means is it's possible to have a real, intimate relationship with his Son. Now, on this earth, before we are perfected, through his Holy Spirit. Do you want to get to know him? Do you want to know him more? Do you want to be prepared? Do you want to be amongst those whom Revelation says the bride has made herself ready? What do you think that means? Let me ask, I always remember something that Barry Smith, I suppose remembers Barry Smith. I always remember an example that Barry Smith gave on one of his videos a long time ago now. And it was of a man who was due to marry this woman on a particular day and he was there at the church and he was waiting and waiting and waiting and the bride never turned up. So he turns to the best man and says, go and see where she is. Go and see why she's been held up. And so the best man goes round to the, the bride's, to be's house and he finds her there lying on the settee in her jeans and a t-shirt, eating chocolates and reading a magazine and she says, oh, hello. What are you doing here? And he says, you're supposed to be somewhere today. And she says, well, was that today? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll start getting ready. And the groom will say, the wedding's off. Would you want to be married to someone like that? Neither would I. Neither does God. He wants a people who love him enough to prepare themselves for him. To ready themselves. To allow themselves to be cleansed and purified and made holy through that precious life that's been given to us through his Son by the Holy Spirit. To build that relationship that we at least know him to the extent we can know him until that day that we are perfected. What an opportunity God has given us to be able to know him. And you know, our part is just to submit to him. Submit to his work in us. By his Holy Spirit. Not to fight it. Not to resist it and say, I don't want you to touch that bit. But to submit to him. 
It's worth it. It is worth it. And then will be the consummation when we will be as he is. So then, what's our vision? What's your vision of Yahweh today? Is it one that causes us to throw off restraint and do what we want to do? Be what we want to be and go where we want to go? Or is it one that sees the awesomeness and the magnificence and the majesty of the God who called us to himself through his Son to be as he is? To develop that relationship with him that will last for eternity. It begins now. We only get one shot at it. When we die, it's too late. I know it's not nice to talk about death from the pulpit, but it's a fact, isn't it? Each and every one of us in here, unless the Lord tarries, will die. And after death, the judgment. It's just how it is. And so he's given us time to develop our relationship with him, to know him, to know him. Is that the cry of your heart? Spirit, reveal him to me. To hear what he's saying. Do you hear what God is saying to you into your life? Or is it been blotted out by other voices? God wants a people who will love him and respect him for who he is, for what he is, and for what he has done. Can you do that? Will you do that? God wants us to come and worship this incomprehensible God. But he's made himself known through his son. Our part is to get to know him by the time we devote to him. And the answer as to how far and how deep we go is one that only you can answer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we we can sometimes just have such a small vision of you. A God to suit ourselves. A God that we can put into a particular pigeonhole in our life. But you are far beyond any pigeonhole. You are far beyond anything we could ever ask or think. You are immeasurable, incomprehensible, almighty living God. But we thank you today that as we come and take this bread and this wine that You have given us the opportunity to know you. To get to know you. And we just want to bring our thanks and our worship for that incredible blessing. That incredible privilege through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we take this bread and this wine, I pray that, Lord, you would just Grant a new and living and vibrant vision of you to burst in our hearts and our minds. And I pray that, Father, you would take us forward, take us on deeper into you, that we might become more like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and make ourselves ready for that great and terrible day. that we will meet you face to face. Father, have your way amongst us. 
And may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen.